Maryland men's lacrosse has double-digit wins for the 19th straight season. Terps baseball takes two of three up in Minnesota and what's going on with the women's basketball program? We'll answer that question and a whole lot more coming up on the Left Bench TV. It's really cool and it's really neat. It's awesome to be a part of for sure. Hello and welcome back to the Left Bench TV, your sideline source for all things Maryland sports. I'm Tino Qualiata. And I'm here, Bruno. Thanks for being with us. There's a lot we need to break down this week, so let's get right to it. Kira, Maryland men's uh, lacrosse was put to the test against the top five opponents Sunday night. That's right, Tino, and I was at Capital One Field to catch all the action. John Tillman's men's lacrosse team took on number four Rucker Sunday night and dominated the Scarlet Knights 17-9 continuing to show why they're the number one team in the nation. The Terps started scoring early on and they led at the end of the first quarter 6-2. Keegan Khan put on a show leading the team with four goals and two assists as well as notching his fourth hat trick of the season. Ten total Terps scored on the night. And it was a big night for number one Logos Wisnowskis who stamped his name in the record books as the program's all-time leader in career points with 292. Wisnowski has passed Jared Bernhardt's record with an assist to Eric Molliver in the third quarter, and he also added three goals on Sunday. Here's Tillman after the win. We just felt like for us, we needed to make sure that we worked a little bit, you know, got them in, got them out, um, changed the field, uh, spread them out a little bit more, um, and dodged, but also like knew it wouldn't be easy. Um, so uh, we wanted more movement than what we had seen um, because I feel like they are very experienced there. Most of their guys are, are fourth, fifth uh, year type guys, so, um, and their goal is terrific. So uh, I think the fact that the guys kind of bought into that, which they've been doing all year. It's kind of the way they're wired. It's just fun to see, and I think all of them know if they give up the ball, there's a good chance it could come back to them, and th that trust goes a long way. The Terps will take on another top 10 team when they host number nine, Ohio State, in College Park on Saturday, looking to stay undefeated. Stay tuned for the coverage from TLV's Johanna Wolkoff. Logan Wisnowskis now sits alone atop Maryland's points list, but Sunday night was less of a coronation and more of a collaboration for the fifth year. Kevin McNulty explains. Three goals and or assists. That's all Maryland men's lacrosse fifth year Logan Wisnowskis needed to become the program's all-time points leader on Sunday. The Sykesville native started his day with back-to-back -back goals in the first quarter, just 22 seconds apart. They were his 28th and 29th goals of the season, which leads the Terps. The scores put him in a tie atop the list with his old buddy Jared Bernhardt, who was on hand for the milestone day. Then in the third quarter, history. Wisnowskis dished to Eric Molliver to surpass Bernhardt in the record books. And after the game, Wisnowskis shared gratitude for his teammates and their brotherly bond. It's really cool and it's really neat. And it's awesome to be a part of for sure. And you know, you come here and it's really truly a brotherhood. You know, you get to meet like a, a bunch of people, you know, carry relationships for the rest of your life. Number one's assist to Maliver was the 291st point of his Maryland career. And with 118, he sits fourth all time on the program's assist list. He never brings up like how many points. He doesn't play any different whether he scores or he doesn't score. He just loves playing. John Tillman has been coaching the Maryland legend for four years. And at this point in his career, he appreciates his ability to lead by example. When a guy who's that good is still working on his fundamentals and it's early in the season, like the young guys see that. He doesn't take anything for granted. He's got a standard that he sets for himself, um, but it's never about himself. There's a new point king in College Park. And while his days are numbered in a Maryland uniform, his career and legacy won't be forgotten anytime soon. I joke with him sometimes. I'm like, what am I going to do without you? Um, but I want him to know even now before, like how much he's meant to us, how much he means to me, and how much I enjoy just being around him. For the Left Bench TV, I'm Kevin McNulty. Now, Tino, I was at the game on Sunday night, and so were the 2017 National Championship team. So it was so awesome they were able to be there for Logan's big night. And I know Jared Bernhardt and Logan are really good friends, so it was really cool for Jared to be there especially. Makira, the Hardshells aren't the only ranked Maryland lacrosse squad that's coming off a big win. 
The ninth-ranked women's team hosted Penn State on Thursday, and despite the rain, it was the Emily Sterling and Aurora Accordingly show. Accordingly is leading the nation in points this season, so it was to no one's surprise that the graduate transfer led Maryland offensively, notching six points from five goals and one assist. On the defensive end, Sterling was on fire. The junior goalie set a career high with 13 saves on the day and is now leading the nation with a .56 save percentage this season. In her last three games, Sterling has totaled 31 saves and allowed only 15 goals. The Terps spread the wealth on the other end, with Eloise Clevenger netting a career-high three goals and Victoria Hench scoring two. Maryland coasted to a 13-9 win over the Nittany Lions. It's right back to business for Kathy Reese's squad on Wednesday, as they head to Jersey for a ranked matchup with number 12 Prince Princeton at 7 p.m. They won't be, be back at the Plex until April 23rd for their home finale against the third-ranked Northwestern. You know, Kira, I'm really excited to see how the, the women's team will take this season going in for the rest of the spring. Yeah, I've been a fan of this team since I was younger, so they've been doing so well for so long, and it's very exciting. Well, just like women's lax had been on a roll before its most recent win, Maryland baseball made this trip to Minneapolis this weekend, looking to extend its win streak to three. And they ended up extending it to four with wins on Friday and Saturday. So we'll pick this series up on Sunday. It was Savakul Sunday in the Twin Cities, but the Gophers didn't seem to care about that, as they tallied a pair of runs in the bottom of the first. In the next half inning, Maryland responded. Troy Schreffler Jr. with a double to right center to score Matt Shaw from first and bring Maryland within a run. Savakul would settle in as well. The sophomore tossed six innings of one run ball after his hiccup in the first. He finished the day with three runs allowed on just four hits while fanning seven. After Baba Aline singled in Kevin Keister to cut the lead in half, the Terps turned to Villanova transfer Nick LaRusso to tie the game in the seventh. But Minnesota would take the lead back with an unearned run in the bottom of the eighth, stealing the last game of the series 4-3. to three. Maryland softball is also on a roll after taking two of three from Purdue this weekend. It marks the Terps' third Big Ten series win this season and the team's best conference start since 2015. The first game of Saturday's doubleheader saw Maryland fall to Purdue 5-2 but they bounced right back in game two. Michaela Jones was the star of Saturday's second game with a grand slam in the first to get Maryland on the board early and help them to a 9-0 win. Sunday's game secured the series victory after a tight 2-1 win. Up next, Maryland will host another Big Ten foe in 12th Frank, Michigan. That series will kick off Thursday at 6 p.m. and TLB's Alana Renbaum will have the coverage. You know, Kara, I'm really excited to see what Maryland's big bats will do against an opponent like Michigan. Yeah, definitely. It will be a very interesting and exciting series to watch. Maryland tennis had had quite a successful season so far, standing at 14-4 before Nebraska came to town on Sunday. You're right, Tino, but the Cornhuskers shut the Terps out in their first home loss of the season. After downing the Iowa Hawkeyes Friday night to extend their home win streak to 11 matches, Maryland ran into trouble Sunday afternoon against Nebraska. The Terps' struggle started in doubles play as the Cornhuskers won two of the three matches for the point. At one doubles, 89-ranked doubles pair Selma Carrar and Mary Brumfield dropped their set 6-2. At two doubles, the Terps had life as Menorca Miranda and Marta perez Murr won their match 6-2, which meant the winner at three doubles would win the doubles point for the team. But Jojo Bach and Francesca Ferro fell 6-1 at three doubles, giving the Cornhuskers their first point of the match. More struggles continued in singles action as the Terps dropped three more matches. Brumfield was defeated at four singles, 6-0, 6-0. Bach lost 6-3, 6-2 at five singles, and the match was clinched by Nebraska's Christina Novak at one singles, as she beat Kadar 6-4, 6-2, and earned Nebraska the 4 to nothing win. Here's what head coach Katie Daughtery had to say after the match. At this point today, you're always going to be after a loss, but, you know, Nebraska's a good team, and, um, you know, we had to... We have a great day to beat them, and we didn't. And you know, that's part of the season, the ups and downs, and just got to regroup and be ready for Indiana. When we come back, we'll go over everything you need to know about what an insane week of transfer portal announcements means for Maryland women's basketball. And we'll fill you in on who Kevin Willard has added to his coaching staff. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Left Bench TV. Following Maryland women's basketball Sweet 16 exit in the Big Dance. The team is making headlines for reasons no one saw coming. All-American Angel Reese, Ashley Owusu, Mimi Collins, Shanice Lewis, and Ty Koslova each entered the transfer portal. And it all happened within 48 hours. We're now happy to be joined by Testudo Times Women Basketball 
Bee writer Ben Dixon to go over what's been happening with the program and what it means for the future. Ben, thanks for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. So after following this team all season long, all the way through their run through the Sweet 16, did you ever see this coming? You know, it's hard to predict a, a mass exodus like that with five players transferring, only two rotation players when healthy coming back, especially all Americans like Andrew Reese and Ashley Uso, really hard to predict those. But you take a step back through the, the tough year it was with injuries, illness, personal matters, whatever it was, it makes it a little easier to kind of comprehend what exactly happened. But still, there's no rhyme or reason and probably will be no rhyme or reason for why a mass exodus happens, at least to the public, each, each and every year with each team. Ben, last week's events reminded many people of the aftermath of the 2020 season, when Kyla Charles, Stephanie Jones, Shakira Austin, and Taylor Mixell left the program. Two for the pros and two for the transfer portal. Is that comparison valid, and do you consider this a recurring problem for Brenda Fries? I think any time there are a lot of people that leave the program, the comparisons have to come about. But with that said, uh, I wouldn't necess necessarily say it's a recurring problem for Brenda Fries, just given what she's done. Look at what she was able to do after that mass exodus reloaded with, you know, Katie Benson, Chloe Bibby, Angel Reeser freshman year, Ashley Luce and Don Miller taking a step forward in the 2021 season, or 2020, 2021 20, 20, season, excuse me, losing in the, uh, in the Sweet 16. But obviously no one expected that from them the year they had there. So I think if there's anyone that you really shouldn't doubt in the coaching industry, it is Maryland head coach Brenda Fries, who's the best in the business when it comes to recruiting the portal, recruiting freshmen, just reloading teams. So recurring problem, maybe something to worry about, I wouldn't say. Now let's talk more about what Fries has done since everything went down last week. So just looking at social media, it seems like the 2021 AP Coach of the Year has blocked out all the negative energy and gone back out on the recruiting trail. Do you think she'll continue that approach? I think absolutely, and I think there's no reason why she shouldn't. Social media is a weird place in 2022. You look at Angel Reese the day after the season saying, I'll be back, we'll be back, trust me, and a week later she's in the transfer portal and everyone's shocked. So things happen, it's, it's college sports, it's life. Uh, you gotta expect the unexpected sometimes, but Brenda Free is obviously blocking out the quote unquote haters, blocking out some of the outside noise. It's definitely a good approach to take. She'll continue to do so. I mean, she got two four-star top 55 recruits today. Uh, back in the 2022 class. So I don't think there's anything to worry about there. Well, Ben, that's all we have for you. Thanks, for, thanks again for coming on and, uh, and processing all of this with us. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Be sure to keep up with all of Ben's coverage of the Terps on Twitter and online at testudotimes.com. Brenda Fries' squad isn't the only basketball team making big changes this offseason. TLV's Ricky Podgorski is here to fill you in on who's joining the coaching ranks of Maryland men's basketball. Ricky? Well guys, Kevin Willard has been really busy filling out his squad for this upcoming season, making three new additions to his coaching staff. All of the new hires have a connection to Willard, a connection to the DMV, or both. Each was a priority for the new skipper during his selection process. First, joining the Terrapins coaching staff from fellow Big Ten school, Ohio State, is Tony Skin. Skin is a Maryland native and an 11-year coaching veteran. The most interesting part about this hire from Maryland is that Skin worked with head coach Kevin Willard from 2018 to 2021 at Seton Hall. Skin has all he needs to be a successful coach in College Park. He has plenty of chemistry with Coach Willard, he has coaching experience in a competitive Big Ten conference, and he is an elite recruiter and player developer. Skin was a player on the historic 2006 George Mason team that made a Final Four appearance as an 11 seed, so he also has experience in the big dance. Next up, we have Grant Bill Meyer who, like Tony Skin, was a member of Ken Willard's staff at Seton Hall. Bill Meyer was on the staff for 11 seasons and will be following his boss to College Park. In a 2020 st stadium survey, he ranks second among top assistant coaches in the Big East, and he's considered one of the best big man player developers in the game. Seton Hall has had some of the best forwards and centers in the Big East, with players like Sandro Mamokelishvili and Ike Obeigo. Bill Meyer has plenty of promise to develop Maryland big men, whoever they can be. The last recent hire to the Terrapin staff is David Cox. Cox is a Maryland native and is coming home after serving as head coach at the University of Rhode Island for four seasons. Cox knows his way around the NCAA with more than 20 years of sideline experience. The most promising element he'll bring to the staff is his recruiting ability. The Terps ranked 45th nationally in their 2021 recruiting class and 61st in 2020. For a program that considers itself a top de 10 destination in college basketball, that aspect could use some growth. 
Now guys, there are two main things that stand out to me about this, these new additions to the coaching staff, and that's recruiting and experience. Many of these coaches have experience on that Seton Hall roster, and most of these coaches have DMV experience. So I'm really excited to see what kind of recruiting class we can get here, and uh, what kind of top 25 potential this uh, next upcoming recruiting class can get. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Kevin Willard coming in with this energy, already picking up his staff, ready to go. That's what I think fans need right now. Yeah, I'm really, and I'm really excited to see w what he'll do in that first recruiting class uh, of his Maryland tenure. Now, we're not done yet, because when we come back, we'll be joined in the studio by Maryland Gymnastics coach Brett Nelligan to recap the historic season. We'll tell you which men's Tworathon winner is now an, an NFL hopeful, and it's not Matt Rambo. Then, of course, we'll crown our top five plays, Terp of the Week and Pro Terp. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back once again to the Left Bench TV, where it's time to talk some gymnastics for likely the final time this year. Yes, it is. Tino, the gym terps were put to the test against some big-time opponents in the NCAA regionals this year. How did they fare? Well, Kira, they actually made history in Raleigh, but couldn't advance past the major numbers Michigan and UCLA put up. In order to advance in the tournament, the 20th ranked Terps had to place higher than at least two of the teams in their quad meet. But taking down number three Michigan and number 14 UCLA proved to be no easy feat. The Terps 196.025 was the highest in program history at NCAA Regional, but it wasn't enough to overpower UCLA's 197.6 and Michigan's 196.4, placing third in the meet ahead of UNC. They end their season with an 18-9 record and made history on plenty of accounts, from Audrey Barber taking the all-time program scoring record to earning their highest scoring ever at a Big Ten championship, to ending the season ranked 20th in the nation. It was a season no Jim Turp fan will be forgetting anytime soon. We're now so excited to be joined by the man behind the successful season, head coach Brett Nelligan. Coach, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you guys for having me. Coach, let's start with regionals. Though it wasn't exactly the ending you would have wanted for the season, you guys still made history with your highest ever score at NCAA Regionals. Can you sum up what that day was like for your team? It was an incredible experience, and I was so proud of this team for everything they've accomplished all season, and um, we really just didn't want the season to end. So, you know, they, they battled and they fought, and we were trying to get to that next round. But um, I think what we've established as an expectation for our program is that um, we're a team that can compete for Sweet 16 and, and further on um, from here on out. So it was a great day, and um, I'm just really proud of the team. The end of a season always means the loss of seniors. You're losing some big names next year, especially Audrey Barber. What has it meant to watch your seniors grow over the last few years? And looking ahead, how excited are you for incoming freshmen? Yeah, I've really enjoyed uh, their journey um, from coming in as freshmen and, and now to this their senior year. And, to leave their, their name on the program that the way they have um, has been incredible and I've loved being a part of that journey. Um, we'll certainly miss them and um, not just their scoring though. It's really what they brought to the table as leaders, as upperclassmen, as teammates, as um, athletes and what they meant to this university as well. So um, we'll miss them but they're off to do great things and we're proud of them already. Now, looking back with Audrey breaking the program record, Emma and Aleka coming back from major injuries, multiple record-breaking performances, it's been a pretty historic season for you guys. So what has it been like for you, and what are you taking from it? You know, I just had so much fun with this team this season, um, and I'm so grateful for uh, the way they've approached this year. They were... They battled every day in practice. They worked so hard, but above that, they took care of each other. You know, they, they loved each other. They loved this coaching staff. They loved the university. And I think that's what I'll always remember this with this team is how hard they work and how much they cared about one another. Well, Coach, that'll do it for today. But we want to thank you for joining us, and congrats on a great season. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Thanks. The Gym Turts have accounted for plenty of our top plays this season, but now we're in the full swing of spring sports. So, Tino, start us off for this week's top five plays. Sure thing, Kira. Kicking things off at number five is the women's lacrosse highlight queen herself, Aurora Cordingly. Here's Cordingly netting one unassisted against Penn State, and it was so nice, we gotta watch it twice. What a move there. Up next at number four, it's Kylie Goff with a crazy catch against Purdue on Sunday. The sophomore catcher sees the ball fly up and dives straight to the ground for the out. Talk about dedication. And at number three, it's the guy who led the Hardshells in scoring on Sunday night, Keegan Kahn. Kyle Long shoots it. 
It ricochets. Then Eric Mollover grabs it and passes to Khan, who leaves the Rutgers goalie speechless. In at number two, it's Jason Savicole showing off his athleticism on the mound. The ball bounces straight back to him. He sees an opportunity and takes it, diving to throw the ball towards second and add two outs to the board. What a play on Savvy Sunday. And the moment you've been waiting for, our top play of the week, this one wasn't even a question. When sophomore Daniel Kelly's teammate couldn't get in on the first shot, he said no problem. Kelly goes behind the back without hardly anyone knowing. Absolutely insane stuff for the final go goal of that dominant Maryland win. And our Terp of the Week is someone you just saw in our top five plays, attackman Keegan Khan. Khan had himself a day on Sunday. He was basically a highlight reel, leading the hard shells with four goals and two assists. Not to mention it was his fourth straight game with a hat trick. The grad transfer from Villanova has 20 goals and 18 assists on this season proving that he'll be a pivotal piece in the Terp success this year. Congrats, Keegan, on being named our Terp of the Week, and we look forward to the unbelievable plays we'll see out of him for the rest of this season. MLB opening day means that former Dirty Terps are back on the Major League Diamond, and none shine brighter this weekend than Tampa Bay's Brandon Lau. He's this week's pro Terp. No surprise, the Rays swept the Orioles in a three-game set down in Tampa. And during their 8-0 win on Sunday, B. Lau launched a two-run no-doubter over the right center field wall to put them up 4-0. Now in its fifth season with the club, Lau is expected to be a mainstay in Tampa's lineup again this year. The athletes who participated in Maryland football's NFL Pro Day on March 30th hope they'll be pro terps soon. That includes players who weren't invited to the Combine last month and one who never even played Division I football. Kevin McNulty has more. Last year, the NCAA's best lacrosse player shocked everyone when he ditched rubber for pigskin. Jared Bernhardt is Maryland lacrosse's all-time leading scorer. After exhausting his eligibility in college bark, the Florida native took a leap of faith. He transferred to Division II Ferris State to play football. There, he accomplished something he did just once for the Terps, win a national title. I was just taking it day by day, um, you know, and did, you know, well with Ferris, um, you know, no complaints there. For the past 10 months, all of Bernhardt's energy and athleticism have been put toward one goal, making it to the National Football League. I'm never satisfied. If I would have been satisfied, I probably wouldn't even be doing this. So when his alma mater extended an invitation to its NFL Pro Day last week, Bernhardt didn't hesitate. Went away. Did a tremendous job leading his team to a national championship, and uh, glad to see him have an opportunity as well. Former Turk. After playing quarterback last season for the Bulldogs, Bernhardt will try to make it as a wide receiver professionally. While he hasn't gotten as many NFL looks as the top prospects from Division One, the question he keeps asking is, "Why not me?" You know, it's right there in front of you. There's no secret formula. Um, it takes you know what it takes to do it. So for the Left Bench TV. I'm Kevin McNulty. Well, Tino, seeing Jared be such an incredible player on the lacrosse field and transferring over to football, it's going to be very interesting to see how that goes. And, of course, we, we wish him the best luck here at the left bench in his uh, endeavor to play professional football. Well, that does it for this edition of the Left Bench TV. Be sure to keep up with all of our coverage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We'll see you next week on the Left Bench in Focus as we look at the undefeated Maryland men's lacrosse team with a closer lens.